Uh, anyway, where we stand now, we are in the last two weeks of classes. Uh, we have exactly one and a half lectures left to go in terms of stuff I have to tell you, okay? So today is officially, this is the last lecture I'm giving you in terms of PowerPoint stuff. But the stuff we did last time was uh, difficult enough that once the basic concepts have been presented to you, now's the time you have to back off and start thinking about what it means one step at a time. So today what we're going to do is recap the lecture that we did last time to a point and then I'm going to stop, turn on the lights again and then come back and more or less go over stuff one step at a time for the HST, LST transitions. Okay, so this is chalkboard stuff. Now I would very highly recommend that while I'm doing this stuff you're following along with a series of diagrams. All right? This is the type of stuff that is best done when you're drawing as we go, not sitting around twiddling your thumbs or not making notes at all. Okay? This is a fairly important stuff. We have some additional stuff we have to think about. I want you to start thinking about it now. There's a final exam in this class. It'll be the final exam for my part. I want you to start, start thinking now about whether you want to be open book or closed book. We'll make that decision early next week, okay? So you have a, or actually we can make it in, in our lab session tomorrow if you want to do that too. It's up to you, all right? The longer you have to prepare, I guess the better it is ultimately. But it will be done on the basis of a vote, majority rules. Open book means you can use all the book notes that you have, including all the PowerPoint lecture notes you printed off if you want to do that. Closed book means you have no access to that. But remember, closed book tests, I will ask you more cutting questions. There won't be things like definitions or stuff like that. It will be more uh, put together stuff. Okay, so as a general rule, if you have access to all your notes, the question is going to be harder. So if it's, if it's uh, closed book, is it going to be more like the term? Yep. Yeah, definitions, stuff like that, concepts. And remember, there will be stuff on the whole sequence stratigraphy component stuff. That's why you've got to be aware of how this all works. Okay? All right? The last lab that we have is going to be assigned tomorrow. It is a uh, seismic stratigraphy lab exercise where you basically have to look at a series of seismic lines, pick out certain um, uh, reflectors, and then more or less map out those reflectors in a 3D approach. Okay? And that I'll give you two full weeks. Remember, we have a lab tomorrow. We also have the lab the following Thursday. That is a lab day. Okay, so we have two labs left in this course. And yes, Thursday is a full-blown class. Friday exams start. There's no dead date this year, so welcome to the, the real world. And if I'm not mistaken, we have a Saturday exam for this course, don't we? Uh, I cannot change that. Those of you that have some issues in terms of not being able to do the exam on a Saturday, come see me and we can talk about it. But remember, if you push this back too far, if I don't have time to mark your exams and give you the grades in, because we have a very short turnaround time for getting the grades posted, then I'll have no choice but to give you an incomplete. All right, so be aware of that. So as far as your other labs go, if all goes as planned, I'm currently struggling to mark the uh, Geology 111 rock and mineral collections. I have to give them back to them tomorrow because I have to get their attendance grades all sorted out. So that's what I'm doing now. Uh, I'm going to start working on marking your seismic lab exercises first and I may, I may get them back to you tomorrow um, but you'll get all of your seismic, the big, uh, the first project, the um, uh, SP log things, you'll get back that, you'll get that back on Monday, okay? So um, it's coming along, the uh, web page is all sorted out, I think. Almost there, two weeks to go. Now that if you missed the connotations, if this is more or less the last la uh, lecture that's formally done in PowerPoint presentations, and we have three slots left, uh, th I'm going to drag this lecture on, obviously, because you know we're not going to get through much of this today. Um, that means we have a little bit of extra time next week, too, so I might throw another lecture in at you, or I might make it a little bit more of a discussion session, or let it uh, float in terms of what you want to do, okay? All right? Questions? Okay, if you could just shut that off for a second. Uh, we're going to turn the lights back on in a second, too. It's on. Um, because I just want to go and give you a bit of recap what we did last time and then come back 
and reconsider everything in a slower, more steady fashion. So, uh, this is actually sequence stratigraphy two or three, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, the first lecture we did on seismic stratigraphy wasn't sequence stratigraphy, but it still introduced some of the concepts that we're dealing with today. Okay, so last time we dealt with the basic concept of sequence stratigraphy. I introduced the systems tracks to you and then we started talking about some of the systems tracks. Okay, now here's the pertinent stuff that we dealt with last time. Okay, just as a recap before we start getting into the slower step-by-step -step stages here. Okay, number one, we introduced the all-important concept of accommodation space. Accommodation space again is the amount of space that you have to deposit sediment and it is linked to sea level control. When sea level rises, accommodation space increases. When sea level drops, accommodation space will drop. What is another variable in controlling accommodation space? What's the other thing we have to take into consideration? The amount of sediment coming in. All right, that's one an additional variable, but there's yet another one that controls accommodation space. If sea level is changing the amount of sediment that can be deposited, what other thing can actually give the appearance of changing sea level? Not erosion. Not erosion. Amount of subsidence. Okay, if you've got an area where things are sinking, your accommodation space will also increase. Now, incidentally, subsidence is something that's controlled by a, a bunch of different parameters. Tectonic subsidence is the one thing most people think of, okay? If an area is sinking because of tectonics, for example, if you've got convergence somewhere along the area, it will cause the whole region to be depressed. That can be fairly rapid. Certainly, it can overcome the effects of both sea level change and sedimentation. But if it's going to be rapid subsidence due to subduction, it's going to be very narrow in terms of its scope, and then eventually it's going to reverse itself when you start having you know, subduction causing uplift to take place. There are slower stages of tectonic subsidence. If you remember stuff in Geology 112, we talk about the idea that there are basins that develop on cratons. All right, and this is caused by just the natural rise and fall of the continents too, so that does occur. And there's also subsidence that can be linked to compaction of sediment. If you consider how much wet sediment is being deposited in the Mississippi Delta area, for example, this stuff comes in, I mean, within a matter of weeks, you can build up sediment over an entire region, but it's wet mud. And after a while, what happens is the mud will dewater and it will sink. So that, again, has the appearance of increasing accommodation space. And then there's the weight of the sediment itself. If there's enough sediment being deposited, it can actually cause the crust to be depressed a little bit. Okay, So all of these things can change accommodation space. But ultimately, for the large scale stuff we're talking about, we're talking about sea level control. We again talked about the idea of clinoforms. And ultimately, what this is allowing us to do is to start looking for packages of sediment that are associated with specific key events of filling of accommodation space. So we talked about clinoforms with a down lap signature to them, easily identifiable off of a seismic profile if you know what to look for. And when you start seeing things like this, it has connotations. And ultimately, it's looking at these patterns that allows geophysicists to start saying, this is indicating broad scale sedimentation when sea level is at, say, a point like this, where you're getting big packages of sediment being deposited and growing out in this direction. This is progradation. It's not progradation of a delta. It's not progradation of a beach. It's progradation of an entire system of <coughs> depositional systems. All right, so in other words, there's the beach, there's the delta, and this is leading into the offshore areas. These are large scale packages, not small scale stuff that we would study or look at in, say, a sedimentary petrology class. Uh, I sh tried to show you again the uh, types of patterns you're getting, and you know, until you actually start seeing the, a lot of these different seismic lines, you're not going to appreciate the subtleties and the subtle differences that take place. But this was an example of downlap, and I gave you some patterns up here as well. Okay? I didn't show you this diagram because at the time I just didn't have enough time to do it. And I know it's not the sharpest of things, but if you look at this, what you're looking at here now is a very nice shelf sequence. You'll see some very nice horizontal reflectors along the top here. That indicates 
more or less flat lying sedimentation, probably shelf related. And if you look, you're going to see that there's a series of clinoforms going off in this direction. This, incidentally, are not multiples. You're going to see some underlying horizontal stuff interior as well. But these are the clinoforms that you're talking about. And this is how the whole package was interpreted, okay? And again, you have to understand. The people that interpret these things have a lot more information than we do about the timing of things, the dating of stuff. So they're looking at individual packages that all are linked like so. And each one of these things is linked to a corresponding interpretation. Uh, the ODP thing you see here are these are where there was ocean drilling program cores that were drilled through each of these sites along the shelf area here. Yeah. No, no, no. The slump was actually the stuff that's off on the side. This is this is actually internal. Okay, this is these are internal clinoforms forms within it. All right, the slumping that you're looking at in that particular lab, you could tell it was slumping. I said it would look for modern slumping because it was on the outside edge. It was along this point through here. There's no evidence of any slumping that I can see in through here. I don't know what that is there. So what is a slump and what is clinoforms is dependent upon where you're looking, the thickness of packages, and ultimately you know, what, what, uh, what conditions were available for that and also. Okay, so as far as I can tell, there's no something here. I also want to point out something else too, that here, this is the base of the Pliocene. The Pliocene is, what, 10 million years old? So this entire package of sediment is deposited within a span of only 10 million years. Now consider how much geological time we have. And I hope you can have some admiration for the people who established the whole concept of sea level change and pushed it back to the start of the Phanerozoic. You know, they're looking at a hell of a lot of sediment that they had to chuck through and go through. Okay, so in pretty intense stuff. I showed you this diagram here, and this and this is one of those fundamental diagrams that it takes a while to fully appreciate the beauty of something like this. But what it's showing you now is the way that sediment and sea level are linked. Always remember that it's kind of like a bow it's a it's a battle going on. Uh, you could have an equilibrium stage where sea level rise and sedimentation are consistent, but in most cases, one is always going to be beating out the other, or it will change over time. And what you're going to get is a difference in terms of stacking patterns that will ultimately lead to things that you and I would recognize as transgressions and regressions. And see, that's the other thing here, too. The whole concept of sea level rising and sea level falling, you've been introduced to that several times. But you probably never realized just how much goes on as sea level is changing. It's not a simple matter of beaches being replaced by offshore muds. It's not a simple matter of offshore muds being replaced by oolites and then rivers. Sea level doesn't do this in terms of nice changes that gives you nice lateral changes consistent across the entire planet. What happens is when sea level changes, it causes an effect and a response by the sediments along the coastline. So what will happen is you're going to get some backstepping from forward stepping or a lot of interdigitation where you're going to get this type of complex variation. In fact, in some ways, and this is one of the things that's probably the most tricky to go from the simple concepts of how geology works to the practical world of interpreting rocks in, out in the field is that you get things that look like this. You never get the layer cake type of things that we see at the Grand Canyon. Well, actually, I guess that's not true. Obviously, you do because you see them at the Grand Canyon in various places. What you have to do is realize that that layer cake stratigraphy that you see is not sediment going like that, back, and forth. What you're looking at are timelines that cut through the horizontal layers. That's something that took me years after I graduated to fully realize that when you see layers like this flat lying in places like the Grand Canyon, that's not showing the timelines. The timelines cut through things. They go this way, the horizontal layering that looks like this. All right? That will be a difficult thing for you to fully understand. And like me, it won't be until you're long gone from this place. This is a better view of how things change. But the actual sediments being deposited in this way are not going to look like this. And that's a tricky, tricky thing to deal with. Anyway, this introduced our concept of systems tracks. Then I went as far as to talk to you about 
low stand versus high stand systems tracks versus others. Okay, so we're going to recap the different types of systems tracks in a second. But first of all, I want to come back and just talk to you about the whole idea of the low stand systems tracks and how they all work before we go over this in detail. During the low stand systems track development, this is when sea level is in the low stand position. And we have to understand that when sea level is rising and falling, it takes time for that to occur. When sea level is near the bottom point of things, that's when it's at the low stand of sea level. But the low stand systems tracks start to develop long before that occurs. It basically starts the minute sea level starts to fall, you start getting into a different uh, situation. When sea level is at its maximum low stand, all right, that's when low stand systems are still being developed, but then all of a sudden sea level starts to come back up again. All right, so the idea of when these systems tracks are being developed has really a lot to do with where you are in the so-called sea level curve. That's why we have to come back and talk again about that eustatic sea level curve and how it all works. This diagram was put in here just to more or less show you that when you're dealing with this type of sedimentation, you're going to have sedimentary packages being deposited at a certain point here where sea level is fixed. And then you're going to have these very broad scale packages being produced wherever sea level happens to have fallen to. So 18,000 years ago when sea level was at its lowest, all right, and sea level was down approximately where the edge of the shelf is today, 80 miles south of where we are now, all the sediment that was currently being deposited along the Gulf Coast today was more or less being deposited well offshore and is now in incredibly deep water. Now frankly, it was incredibly deep water at the time it was being deposited as well, it was off the edge of the shelf. When sea level comes back up and it reaches its highest stand, of course, then you're into the high stand systems tracks and everything shifts backwards. The actual patterns of sedimentation are going to also be dependent upon the nature of the depositional slope that you were dealing with. All right, now, this is not the best diagram for showing this, but the shelf tends to be flat. When you get to the slope, it tends to drop off fairly significantly, okay? So there's a difference in depositional surface. So it stands to reason that if your depositional surface is flat like this when sea level is high, all of the sediment being produced on a flat surface is going to more or less take into account that it is a flat depositional surface. When you get off to the edge of the slope, and now sea level is at this point, then you're going to find sediment actually taking advantage of that slope and you're going to actually see different packages being deposited. You get a lot of submarine fans being produced, at least initially that way. And the actual client forms that develop are not going to be flat. They're going to actually have some pretty good uh, relief to them. That's something you have to remember in context to what that slide was I showed you about the differences in terms of downlap, onlap, and all that. Because again, all of that interpretation is based upon what the seismic lines are showing you. The pattern of the clinoforms allows you to get a handle as to what type of sedimentation was taking place and from that link it back to determine what kind of depositional surface it was on and from that to link it back to the type of systems track that you were in. Okay? And while that may sound annoyingly cyclic or circular in its argument, it really does make sense if you're consistent with what you do. All right, now here's what we're going to be doing, not so much for today, but for the rest of the course, okay? We're going to come back and do this chalkboard version of some of the systems tracks things. And that's why I'm going to ask you to keep up with me on this, but stop me if I'm getting over your head or you don't follow something, okay? Because you have to understand these basic things to more or less understand the significance of sequence stratigraphy. Um, and then later on, and I'm probably going to stop before we get to this, we'll introduce more systems tracks. We have to talk about the transgressive systems tracks, progressive systems tracks, etc. Boundaries and surfaces. And then, since this is an academic course rather than a petroleum course, I think it would be a really good idea if you had a chance to see what some of this stuff looks like in the field. So I'm going to show you some of the stuff that I've done in New Zealand and others have done around the world that allows you to actually look at the sequences. If you want to see what a high stand systems track looks like, the concept is all done on the basis of seismic stuff, but there still has got to be a representative somewhere in the rocks somewhere. So I'll show you some of the outcrops that allow people to say, this is what a high stand systems track looks like in the field. This is what a low stand systems track looks like in the field. And if you're thinking that there's going to be major differences, 
There really isn't. Not in terms of the sediment. The sediment is going to be just more or less deposited in different areas. That's the real trick to applying the concept of sequence stratigraphy to the real world is being able to visualize not only the rocks where you are, but where you are relative to where sea level is at the time. And as I said, when it, when it hits you, when you fully make sense of it, it is, I mean, you hear angels going, ah, in the background. It's not a light bulb. This is like being hit by a nuclear bomb. It, when it makes sense, all of a sudden you go, choo. And I'll tell you a story of the battle I had with my advisor. It wasn't a battle, but it was one of these, these constant things that should exist between somebody who's working in research and the person who's responsible for monitoring them and basically supervising them. There's always going to be differences of opinion, and someone's going to win eventually. This is one of the few times I actually did win. It's kind of an interesting story. And it was one of those angels nuclear bomb type moments too. Okay. All right, so recap, first of all. System tracks come in numerous flavors. LST stand for Low Stand Systems Tracks. These are the tracks that are established as sea level starts to fall and is approaching the maximum or the, the minimum point. The High Stand Systems Tracks, just the opposite, when sea level is near its high point. Transgressive Systems Tracks, these are rather nebulous. They start when sea level, actually the, the definition of these things can be annoying. If I'm not mistaken, the start of a TST is at when sea level is at its maximum depression is when you start getting a transgressive systems track, when it's just starting to come back up. The falling stage systems tracks, the regressive systems tracks, and forced regressive systems tracks, we're not going to spend much time on here because, uh, frankly, they're so similar in, in so many different ways that their subtle differences are things we don't have to worry about at this point, okay? Now, with that, we're going to turn our attention to the chalkboard, okay? And I really don't have any attention to coming back to the projector here. So what I want using the magic of color chalk. Starting off with white, okay? Uh, what I want, the whole concept now is that we're going to be dealing with sea level change. And I mentioned to you that there's, that the sea level curve looks something like this, okay? And over time, sea level will rise and fall. There will be a maximum sea level, so that's the highest that you're going to get, and there will be a low sea level. Now, I've drawn this as if it's a regular curve. Be realistic on this, okay? Because sea level doesn't necessarily always follow the same style of things. Sea level can do this, have a shorter period, go up, drag on, you get the idea. Realistically, sea level over time can vary all over the place. That's the actual sea level curve. In terms of the conceptual idea of sequence stratigraphy, however, generally what people do is to evaluate sea level on a nice sine form like so. Okay, so we can get rid of all this because, again, from the theoretical side, that doesn't matter. Now, what you do is you divide this up over two parts. From the maximum at this point here, back to the maximum over here, through the minimum at that point, you consider the curve to have two limbs to it. After all, it is uh, kind of like a sine form. This is called the falling limb. This is called the rising limb. Okay? Traditionally, this part up here would be the interval where you get the HSTs being developed. From about this point onwards to about there is where you'd have traditionally what we would call the LSTs. Now, I should point out that depending on whose sources you deal with or who you're talking to, the position of the LST shifts a little bit relative to the curve. Again, remember, this is conceptual. It doesn't necessarily mean that everybody is going to believe in this whole thing. The TST component would be usually in this part here, although I would tend to put it all the way back to the time when sea level starts to rise. And the reason for this is that I am a field person. 
And later on, I will show you the evidence for transgressive systems tracts in the rock record. In fact, in some ways, the transgressive systems tract is the easiest to find the initiation for if the conditions are favorable for preservation. Okay, and that's, that's a bit of a mouthful there. And of course, you could start adding uh, uh, regressive systems tracks and falling sand systems tracks to this, as many people would do. As time goes on, this curve gets increasingly more complex. For the basic concepts that we're doing here now, the main thing to note is that there's going to be an interval of time when sea level is at its highest, there's going to be an interval of time when sea level is at its lowest, and then there will be inflection points. And of course, these are the inflection points here in the same way as you have any inflection on a sine form, okay? All right, now, when you start doing some detailed work on this, when you start taking some short courses on sequence stratigraphy, or if you start reading books, they'll always have a curve something like this in the diagrams that they are showing you, because this is basically almost like a location map. But it's not a location map in terms of where you are. It's a location map in terms of where sea level is at the time deposition is taking place, okay? So I drew this big for you now so everybody can see how the whole concept of this, they call it the eustatic curve. You and that's a bad term, frankly, because uh, it's, it means used to see, but eustatic curve to me means the whole sea level curve over geological time. But this is kind of like a flow chart that shows you, again, where you are relative to everything else, okay? Now, in order to kind of preserve as much space as possible, I'm going to erase this. So hopefully, as I said, you've been keeping up with me. Because I need the whole chalkboard for doing this. And for each of these diagrams, I would strongly recommend you give yourself about half a page, okay? Or like, a, a, or like half, yeah, about half a page for a normal size thing, okay? Starting off now with, we've got to start somewhere, right? So we're going to start off now at point number one with high stand. All right, so if you wish, in terms of the curve, I'll put this over to the side here like this. This is the interval of time that we would be in. Now I'm going to draw a typical section to what you'd find off the coast. And we'll make it kind of look something like this. So all of this now is essentially bedrock. And sea level will be right about at this point here like this. Actually, you know what? I need a little bit more space than that. Sea level will be approximately here. Okay? So from your point of view, this would be a typical Gulf Coast view, with the exception that we don't have a mountain range anywhere, okay? Um, that would be the shoreline right there. So that's sea level right there. Under these circumstances, I don't have red chalk, how, uh, or how to be orange, I guess. Under these circumstances, what you'd expect to find here along the alluvial plain would be fluvial systems. I'm going to indicate this by the ever popular conglomerate pattern. Now, of course, we don't have conglomerates down here because our coastal plain is so flat that we don't have big pebbly things. That's irrelevant. The idea now is that that indicates where the fluvial deposits are going to be deposited. Everyone got that? And of course, you know at the base of this is going to be essentially an unconformity, a disconformity, because fluvial sediments tend to erode downwards into the subsurface. The actual shelf and shore face components will be in the areas that are shallowest. So this would be an area where you're going to start seeing things like beaches and sands, call these shelf sands, the shallow stuff that surrounds all continents. Then what happens is when you get to the edge, here's where you're going to start having this kind of grading out laterally into finer and finer components. So this is the area where you start having mud being deposited. If you're off the edge of the Mississippi Delta, for example, 
this is where you're going to find a tremendous amount of sediment being produced. And again, one thing you should realize is that even though we may not have a huge delta off the, our coastline right now, there's certainly enough sediment coming in from the Mississippi that it influences this whole area. So there's a lot of sediment being produced. Net result is, over time, what's going to happen is you're going to start having this type of progradation taking place. So this would be, call it offshore. This is your typical type of sedimentary relationships that you have when sea level is at a specific point in time that is high. This represents, the whole thing represents, a high stands systems tract. Not any one component of it, but the whole component itself, okay? Everyone okay on this so far? Clearly by now you should start to be able to recognize some things. Notice these are inclined clinoforms. Inclined clinoforms. Is that an oxymoron? I don't know. If there were any up and through here, these would be more or less flat line. But remember, you have to have enough sediment being produced in order to get the resolution that you're going to need for the seismic lines. Everyone got that? Notice at the end through here, this is the downlapping that we talked about before. And this will continue to go on as sea level stays more or less at this position. Now note that even though sea level is at this point is static, as you go off in this direction, the net result is that you're driving what appears to be a, um, uh, a regression at this point because more sediment is being added. This is what happens. If sediment is allowed to start filling in the Gulf of Mexico, it will. And even though sea level is staying fixed, it still has the effects of making it appear as if there's a regression here locally because of the influence of sediment overall in this. All right, so far? All right, now, at this point, we're going to start changing things. What we're going to do is we're going to start shifting sea level time-wise now in this direction. Now we're going to go from this point here into this point there, what represents the LST components of the curve. What I'm going to do, and you have two choices here now in terms of how you do this. If you want to make this make as much sense as possible to you for later on, what I would recommend that you do is start another diagram. I'm running out of space here, but I need to make sure that you're very clear what each of these packages are going to do. So even though I am going to leave this up, what I'm going to do is remove the color so that you can see what is old and what is going to be new. And I'm going to get rid of all this crap here too. All right, so everything that we had before is now going to be redone in white. And the only reason I said that I'm doing this now is to more or less take the color out of it so that we can now go into phase number two low stand. All right, now at this point, sea level is going to drop, and I'm going to drop it down to here. Notice that what had been previously being deposited is going to now be exposed. Traditionally, what we would do is show this as now having unconformity being developed. I'm going to do that in a second. But I think it's also important to realize that you don't always see the whole picture of things when you're looking at it from this type of cross-section. Sometimes it's advisable. Hang on. <laughs> I should have thought this one through. What's the best perspective view? I guess like this. Sometimes it's advisable to also consider it in three dimensions, okay? So if this is where your shoreline was before, and here's where you're getting all your sediment being deposited in more or less like sheets, all right? So here's where all the sediment is being deposited. When you drop sea level now down from this point here down to this point, What happens now is you've exposed all this. 
but you still have water this direction here. You're not going to have all of this forming one continuous river system. What will happen is whatever water or river is coming through here is just going to simply carve along the base here. So along this interval here somewhere you're going to see the effects of essentially a river channelizing through what had been previous sediment and now the sediment is going to be concentrated down here where it's going to be deposited more or less in this general area. It's not going to cover the whole region like it did when high sea level. It's going to more or less focus sediment in one area. But still, it's probably a good idea for us to draw our cross section now going through here so that you're going through the channel. What will happen here is you're going to clearly see when sea level drops, starting to be some erosion in the area that had been deposited previously and somewhere off the edge. It's going to start carving out some of the sediment that had been produced earlier. Remember what we said earlier also about looking for surfaces and seismic profiles? Unconformities are always easier to spot because they do these upward truncations. Truncations indicate that you have some sort of an unconformable surface, at least in this direction. The first thing that happens when you have a low stand of sea level, and you can call it probably in this interval here, that's when you're getting a significant amount of downward cutting. That's when the erosion is taking place. And any sediment that is coming into this area is going to be deposited in this fan-like structure here. Net result is you're going to have sediment being deposited down at the base of what the cloniforms were before. Now notice the orientation of the cloniforms about the same angle you had earlier. Okay, So you can consider this to be the low stand systems track, and the lack of another term, we can call it fan. If you want to put submarine in there, you can. Okay? As sea level continues to fall, however, and it reaches a point like this, you're going to find that these original cliniforms now are going to flatten out and form more of a broad scale sheet deposit that looks like this. All right, so that's where all your sediment is going to be focused in. That represents the entire part of the LST, at least in the offshore component. So this is the offshore sediment. And it is possible that you might get some fluvial things being deposited in these incised channels. So again, I'm going to just put in a little bit of fluvial stuff here to indicate that even though you're causing some incisions, you're still going to get a little bit of potential for fluvial things being deposited in the channel regions. But notice, only here. The rest of the area, no net sedimentation taking place, but nonetheless exposure. So look for potential unconformities. All right? So this represents two parts. Here's the fan component. And what do they call this other thing here? And we'll call the second part here. I guess I better, I'll tell you what, let me, let me color this one in here. So you see clearly that that's the fan, and I think the term that people have used in the past is the wedge component is here. So there's the fan component, and there's the wedge component. Still with me? Are we having fun yet? How's your coloring going? Actually, Kelly Jones emailed me the other day, and she said, have they started complaining about coloring yet? And I said, I don't think so. I haven't had anybody send me bomb threats or anything like that yet. No one's asked me to bore pencil cranes or anything. Yeah? No. This is all, this is all LST. This is all the low stand systems truck. Now, since you asked, again, taking out the color entirely so that we are clearly dealing with different concepts now, different times. By the way, you can appreciate why people who teach this type of stuff are really into PowerPoint. Um, but again, PowerPoint doesn't allow you to really envision the subtleties of how all this all works. Sometimes simply drawing it is the best way. All right. So now we're going to start going to the next phase. Let's start considering the next TST. Uh, sorry, the next component, which in this case is going to be the transgressive systems track. And even though we haven't actually thought much about it, we can still 
think about what's going to happen. As sea level starts to come up, the net result is to increase accommodation space. And as a general rule, if you increase sea level, what it does is it causes sedimentation to step back. You push where sediment's going to be deposited more or less towards the shoreline where it's going to be. So when sea level reaches, say, about this point like this, you've increased accommodation space without allowing sediment to get there. So there's really nothing happening out here. If anything's going to be happening at all, it's going to be happening right where shorelines are. Because that's where the beach is going to be, if you think about it. But the beach isn't static. The beach is being pushed inwards as sea level rises. And if you have a fast enough transgression, what will happen is you'll have left behind, essentially, a small little sequence of sand. That may be all you get for the transgressive systems trap. And here, you're going to have this type of onlap going in that direction. I have never seen clinoforms in the TST, though, because they tend to be incredibly thin. Basically, it's more of a surface than it is a deposit. But that might be all you get of the TST. And of course, once sea level reaches this point again, you're back here at the next HST. And what happens now? Same that happened the first time. You start having fluvial deposits here, shelf deposits here, and again, the next phase of offshore deposits here. This becomes the next TST. Now there's the TST, sorry, the uh, HS. See, I'm starting to forget what everything is now. There's the next HST, called HST2, built up on top of where the other ones were. Pain in the ass, isn't it, if you think about it? But if you understand how this all works, it's predictable. This is the pattern of stuff that you would expect to see in a simple oscillation from one stage of high sand through to a low stand, back up to high stand again. Okay? You get this type of patterning. And of course, this ultimately is what you see in the seismic lines that allow you to go backwards and say, this was an LST, this which is HST, this is another HST, by looking at the pattern of cloniforms and where they are overall. You had a question? Yeah, the, uh, the sand with the TST, would that be like a shelf or a beach sand? It would be a shelf or a beach sand, yeah. Yeah, well, it depends on what, how long it takes for the transgression to take place and a whole bunch of different things. In some cases, the transgressive systems tract may only be that thick. It may not look like anything you've ever encountered before. And again, I'll show you some outcrop shots about what is an equivalent of a TST or what people have interpreted TSTs as being. Remember, this is all theoretical. How rocks respond to all this is entirely different because each environment is going to be different. I mean, we haven't even started talking about the type of energy along here. Is this a high energy shelf? Is it a low energy shelf? Is it tropical? Is it temperate? Every one of those areas has its own controls on the types of sediments that are going to be deposited. This is conceptual. But what it does allow you to do now is start looking for packages, okay? Now here's where, again, the beauty of this all comes in. So once again, removing all of the interior stuff to reduce this to its basic elements. And I hope this blue shows up. This becomes part of one sea level change. There is HST1, there is LST1. Got it? This becomes part of another one, which I'll color in yellow. In fact, I never got as far to... All right, so this becomes now HST2. And of course, the next phase of sea level sand will give you an LST off to the side here. That would become 
L, S, T, 2, et cetera. I'm ignoring the transgressive systems track because I'm not sure if that's the TST for this one or the, or you get the idea, right? It's just one of these annoying little variables as to where you stick it. The point is, after a while, what's going to happen is you're going to get a stacking pattern that will allow you to start thinking about what this means overall to used to see. So, consider now a package that looks like this. And I know I'm out of time. Give me one second to finish this off. All right? There is HST1, LST1, HST2, LST2, HST3, LST3, HST4, LST4. If you can link each of these packages to one another, it starts giving you an idea of not only how sea level has changed over time, but the magnitude of sea level change over time. See the differences between the way I've drawn these? What's the differences? Where the HSTs end up. All right? If the HSTs go out to here, LSTs are there. See how they're kind of positioned relative to one another? This gives you an idea of overall magnitude changes as well. That's what allows people actually, when you start looking at the sea level curve, to have it coming way out here, way back there, or just more subtle variations. As I said, an incredibly powerful technique if you have enough data from around the world to allow you to come up with something that looks like this. All right, now with that, I will leave it there, except to remind you again, we're not done. Tomorrow we have our lab. That will be an opportunity to do sequence, uh, not sequence stratigraphy, but seismic stratigraphy interpretations. Uh, we're going to need as much room as possible for tomorrow. And before, for those of you that are already planning on getting this stuff and taking off again, you're going to need to know how to do this. So make sure you are in the lab and are paying attention. All right? Otherwise, you're going to walk away with this and not know how to conclude. And you're going to need both lab periods to finish this off. All right? Thank you.